What made GoldenEye such a special game when it was released in 1997 by a team of mostly inexperienced developers? I would argue quite a lot, and today we're going on a trip down memory lane to think about GoldenEye, what it brought to the table, and to talk about some of the reasons that it was such a smash success all those years ago. This video is written in such a way that watching isn't necessary. Feel free to listen, but the visual aspect will be ordered to be mostly related to what's being spoken about for added experience. I'll be using footage from the recent Switch port as well as the cancelled Xbox Live remaster for this video. When GoldenEye released, I had admittedly very little experience with the first-person shooter genre, and while this is the decade they would rise to prominence, it wasn't a go-to genre for me. I had played a few on PC, such as the legendary Doom, Rise of the Triad, Duke Nukem, and other games of that ilk. Being a huge Star Wars fan, I had also found my way to Dark Forces. I enjoyed these a lot, but aside from booting them up occasionally for some fun, none of them really hooked me too deeply. Then came GoldenEye 007 for Nintendo 64. I don't even think I was into James Bond. I'm not even sure I'd ever seen a James Bond film at that time. But a friend of mine called me up one day to tell me of a new game he had acquired on the Nintendo 64 that I'd probably like to play or take a look at. He was absolutely right. GoldenEye blew me away for a lot of reasons and sunk teeth into me that have yet to let go to this day in one way or another. Whether that's taking the cartridge out every so often for a playthrough or casually encouraging other people I'd meet to play me in GoldenEye multiplayer years after release. For quite some time, I'd always keep a Nintendo 64 and a GameCube in my car's trunk so that I could throw down on GoldenEye or Smash Melee any time. One thing that GoldenEye did very well was the design of the mission and structure of those missions. Many of the levels offer a sort of sandbox feel in terms of mission objectives. This game offers three difficulty levels to start. Agent, Secret Agent, and Double O Agent. Each subsequent difficulty is a little harder, and what you're asked to do is often a little more involved. Taking the first level, Dam, as an example, Agent asks the player simply to make their way through the level and bungee jump off the dam itself in order to reach the chemical weapons facility. If the player bumps up the difficulty to Secret Agent, an added criteria of disabling all alarms on the stage is mandated. For Double O Agent, the player must do both of those things as well as install a covert modem and intercept the data backup from some mainframes. This means that oftentimes there are entire segments of stages that are unvisited if the player never chooses to visit the higher difficulty levels, but GoldenEye rewards players seeking out that extra challenge with a more detailed environment and additional objectives. One of the things I really enjoy about this game, others could consider a hindrance, and many game players today would likely consider it so. The lack of specific direction in regard to mission objectives. At times, it can be a bit too obtuse, but overall, I enjoy the often vague mission objectives. If you read the mission briefing carefully, hints can often be found as to what you're actually supposed to be doing. But regardless, in the case of the dam, it is never directly specified as to where this covert modem is really supposed to be installed, and where this intercepting of data is to occur. I'd argue there's enough there to go on and to make things interesting without giving too much away. In the mission briefing, we get this bit from Q. Quote, information concerning shipping and contacts is stored on a computer system in a secret ops room within the dam. With this covert modem connected to their satellite link, we can intercept the data when a backup is carried out, unquote. While the bit about the secret ops room isn't all that specific, the room they are referring to has several computer desks set up and a couple of mainframes, so that when you do find this room, it sufficiently stands out, or should, as a location to access those mainframes. Likewise, players who take the time to really absorb the surroundings on this stage can observe a building with a satellite dish upon it, and if you look around the back of this building, you'll see a mounted computer terminal on which you can install the modem. It's things like this that are littered throughout the game that really made me feel like each stage was bigger and more than just a level to run through, and finding out how to do some of the objectives was half the fun. Much different than games today, where you almost always have a quest notifier bugging you or directing you where to go. Level design was another high point for me in GoldenEye. While switches or keys to open doors wasn't anything particularly new, it was another way to immerse me into the game. Take Facility for example. The player starts out in the now famous ventilation shaft above the bathrooms. 
Enemies are spread throughout the bathroom using some of the stalls, and once you make your way down the stairwell, assuming that's the path you choose as opposed to coming down the rear stairway, there are at least a couple of metal doors that aren't immediately accessible. Guards will open at least one of these doors if you start to make a commotion, but they are meant to be accessed with a key a guard standing down one of the hallways is holding onto. Once you make your way into the small control room, there's a console that opens up the door visible through the glass window. Later on in the level, there's a similar room that acts as a sort of guard station to allow, presumably, staff members or guards access to the laboratory or gas storage chambers. There's a level of believability in a lot of the stage design present in GoldenEye that really drew me in. This melds well with the sandboxy design of some levels. Take Facility again. One of the objectives on the harder difficulties is to meet with the double agent, Dr. Doak. Doak can be in a variety of areas including the laboratory area, the aforementioned gas storage chambers, or even in the long hallway leading up to all of these zones. Aside from the occasional population of Dr. Doak in the gas storage chambers, this area is never really used for anything. But it was always interesting to explore all available areas on a given level, often wondering what lay behind each door. This room is kind of interesting for another reason. If Bond gets into a firefight with some present guards, or if he just gets too hot with the scientists, the player can actually puncture some of these canisters and a lockdown procedure begins, making it impossible to escape, and Bond slowly dies of the chemical being released into the environment. A small but memorable detail that really has nothing to do with the game at large or the objectives within it. Obviously getting locked into a storage chamber and dying fails the mission. But this brings to mind another feature of GoldenEye that always kept me playing, and that's the failure of mission objectives. Unlike many games, failing an objective doesn't result in an instant boot out of the mission. Rather, you've failed that particular objective, but can continue to either play around or attempt to complete the other objectives as you wish. Sometimes it's just fun to rampage through the facility, annihilating all of the laboratory staff or whatever suits your fancy. Only exiting the level through death, aborting the mission of your own volition, or exiting through the standard level exit area will end the stage. Though you won't complete the mission with any failed objectives, it's still fun to mess around with, and this fits the general feel that GoldenEye has. While I wouldn't consider GoldenEye a stealth game exactly, even though the player is James Bond, those are also options when playing the game. Levels such as the bunker stages or facility are good examples of this. Players can go in with guns blazing and deal with all the related consequences, such as alarms being triggered, resulting in spawning guards coming in as backup and being swarmed by guards within earshot of the action, or the player can try to take a more stealthy approach, sneaking around the level and utilizing the often given silenced PP7. While it's a bit primitive by today's standards, in the sense that guards can be standing very close to one another and you can use the silenced weapon to eliminate them and they don't particularly notice, the concept of weapon loudness was an exciting feature for me. Using the KF-7 or the silenced PP-7 had direct and immediate results on what gameplay the player would be experiencing next. While on the topic of weaponry, GoldenEye also features a pretty large variety of weaponry and gadgets. Unlike many games today, the player isn't limited to just holding a few. Bond can carry along anything and everything he picks up through the course of the level, including dual wielding quite a few items throughout the main missions. Once you've unlocked the All Guns cheat, you can dual wield just about anything, including rocket launchers or Moonraker lasers. The large variety in the unlockable cheats, more on that in a minute, adds a lot of replayability to the game when simply exploring what the levels have to offer, and it feels that much better having unlocked them. This also allows the player to explore other weapons or items that are more restricted in the campaign to their heart's content on any given level, such as the variety of mines and the watch laser. Gadgets are put to fairly good use throughout the game, be it the aforementioned covert modem, the watch laser, remote mines, tracker bugs, or various other stage-specific items that Bond gets the opportunity to use. This went a long way towards making the game feel like an experience. When I was much younger, beating each stage on 00 Agent was a challenge in and of itself. Enemy accuracy is increased beyond that of a stormtrooper, though not much better, and much more damage is taken when you are hit. Less often will Bond find body armor on the highest difficulty compared to Agent, enemies would take more damage before being defeated, and so on and so forth. But with persistence came rewards, the first of which was many unlockable cheats, which were unlocked by beating various stages on differing difficulties within a time target. For example, 
The first cheat many may unlock is DK mode, which gives all the characters massive heads and arms like Donkey Kong. This cheat is often the first because the requirement is beating the short runway stage on the easiest difficulty, Agent, within a target time of 5 minutes. These target times were similar to what Doom offered with their par times given at the end of each stage. The unlocked targets rotate in a set sequence. For example, the first stage's cheat is unlocked on Secret Agent, the second stage is Double O Agent, and the third stage back down to Agent. The fourth stage requires Secret Agent, and so on. This means that even if you are pretty bad at the game, you could likely unlock about one third of the cheats. I recall most of them being pretty easy to unlock, but there were a couple that stood out as being very difficult when I was much younger. These two being Invincibility, which is unlocked by beating Facility on Double O Agent in under 2 minutes and 5 seconds, and Invisibility, which is unlocked by beating Archives on Double O Agent in under 1 minute and 20 seconds. While I had no problem unlocking every cheat in the game fairly easily when the Switch version dropped in February of 2023, I remember a great feeling of accomplishment to finally unlock every cheat in the game when I was younger, but especially these two. Honorary mention goes to unlocking Infinite Ammo Cheat on the control stage of Secret Agent difficulty. These target times encouraged a sort of speedrunning after a fashion. While it's nothing like some of the speedruns performed today, that is to say those are much faster, the general concept still applies. On stages with requirements like the 1 minute and 20 seconds on Archives, players will never manage to make the time if they stop to deal with every enemy they encounter. Instead, they have to consciously choose to skip enemies and make a run for it, saving every precious second in order to try and unlock those cheats. This is one of the earliest times I can remember specifically trying to beat a game or stage with the intention of doing it quickly, which I found to be an exciting and rewarding experience. But that's not where the fun or rewards end. GoldenEye sports two unlockable bonus levels that are not tied to the main plot or campaign. The first of which is Aztec, based on the Moonraker film, is unlocked by beating every stage on the Secret Agent difficulty. This is one of my favorites, and is also possibly the most difficult stage in the game. Once you've mastered Aztec, if you manage to beat every stage on Double O Agent, the final stage is unlocked. Egypt. This stage is based around the Golden Gun, and while it isn't nearly as interesting as Aztec in terms of design or objective, it's still a pretty cool inclusion to the game. Rare wanted to do even more, including previous Bond likenesses in the game, but this was squashed by the powers that be. It's interesting to think about how amazing this game turned out with such an inexperienced team, and worth pondering how much better it would have been had they no constraints. There are other fine details to Goldeneye that may be overlooked today, but were fantastic in 1997. Enemy soldiers have a variety of animations when hit in different portions of their body, adding to the realism and believability of what's going on in the game world. Shooting a soldier in the arm or leg will result in a fairly believable animation as a result, and there are a variety of death animations that can play depending on circumstances or random chance. Even though you're supposed to avoid civilian casualties when civilians are present, occasionally, specifically the scientists, they will catch a stray bullet or perhaps you've intentionally shot them a few times. When they've taken enough punishment, they are liable to pull out a DD-44 pistol on you. The random occasion they'll also see fit to toss a grenade your way. It's hilarious that the scientists are armed, and this is an awesome aspect to stumble upon for the first time when they start chasing you down and possibly kill you because you aren't expecting aggression from them. I love the fact that they aren't completely helpless bullet sponges. Not only this, but even though minimizing civilian casualties is often an objective when they are present, Generally, a couple of them can die before you fail that objective. I'm a huge fan of this because those scientists really love to walk into grenade explosions or are all too often unwilling to get a move on during a firefight. Considering everything explodes in this game, including file cabinets and tables, it's not too hard to accidentally kill a scientist or two. It's also amazing to consider that one of the features of Goldeneye that's best known was essentially an afterthought and almost didn't make it into the game. The multiplayer. I simply can't count the amount of hours that I put into this game playing four-player split-screen deathmatch. While the game definitely could have benefited from having a few more stages to select from, I was always happy to jump into a match on Archives, Complex, or Facility. While we enjoyed a lot of Mario Kart 64 Battle Mode, Goldeneye was certainly the go-to console game to have multiplayer fun for years. Between the huge variety of characters to select and the various game modes, players could make their own fun. 
Some favorites of mine were always proximity mines, remote mines, or license to kill pistols. This is one thing I'm quite happy about regarding the recently released Switch port is the ability to play multiplayer matches over the internet. While I do wish that they had included a random matchmaking, maybe one day. Another topic I'd like to touch upon is the cancelled Xbox Live Arcade remaster that was unfortunately terminated, even though it was effectively finished in terms of development. Fortunately, this was indeed leaked and is easily playable on a decent PC with an Xbox 360 emulator, and you can even get the online working, though I haven't tried to mess with that as of yet. It's truly a tragedy though that this product was never made into an official release. Having played it through entirely and beaten it on Double O Agent, I can say it's very well done and highly recommend that any GoldenEye fan give it a look. It plays exactly as it should and looks incredible, with wonderful draw distances that give levels like Surface an entirely new feel and life. I love everything about the cancelled remaster and have put a lot of hours into it recently. It's sad that for whatever reason this ended up canned. Probably disputes over licensing or related issues. But in the end, it's out in the wild and no one makes any money. A bit like poisoning the well they sought to protect. Props to whomsoever saw fit to leak the code into the wild. Many thanks to you, Nameless Hero. Goldeneye is a game I'll never forget. Between the many hours exploring and enjoying the single player challenges, to the many hours playing multiplayer split screen with friends. It's an experience I hold dear to my heart even after all this time. Few games leave such a lasting impact as time carries its ceaseless march forward, but this game is absolutely one of them. The impact this game had on the industry was strong, becoming the third best selling title for the Nintendo 64. I still enjoy playing this game even today, and probably always will. There's just something that feels so right about the gameplay mechanics. I think I've covered most of the reasons this game is special to me. What about you? Drop a comment and reminisce with me about what made this game special to you. If you made it to the end of this video, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel as this helps push me to make more content of this style if I know that it resonates with someone out there. Until next time.